Before we begin, ring the bell. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, uh, either uh, in person here at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories or over Zoom for the thesis defense of uh, Alexandra Stella. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce her. And before we do that, I just want to thank a few people that are here. Her mom, Rebecca, her brother, Dominic, is here joining us today. Uh, her committee, well, Cheryl will be here shortly. <laughs> and Amanda is joining on Zoom because she's still in Canada or traveling or something like that. And uh, thanks everyone else for coming. I think for people that are on Zoom, at the end, if you wanna ask questions, I think type it into the chat and then we will read it out and uh, we'll ask your question to Alex. And, and otherwise, yeah, there'll be time for everyone to ask questions uh, at the end. So uh, a little bit of an introduction to Alex and her journey. So, right, so Alex has always been very inquisitive about the world, right? You can see there from the picture on the left, right? she's always very happy very curious, trying to figure out what's going on. But then, yeah, on the other side there, you can see, she also has that tenacious streak and she's very determined. And I got to see both of these Alexes uh, while she was here. I mean, it was really a pleasure uh, to work with her. She was very hardworking, you know, always very agreeable, you know, suggest something, she would go and do it right away. But I also saw that tenacious side as well. She came in, she said, I'm gonna finish in three years. And I was like, well, that's kind of rare at Moss Landing to be like, I'm gonna do it and you're gonna help me get there. I'm like, okay. <laughs> She's like, I'm gonna do these like 100 different experimental trials in two months. And I was like, yeah, right. Nope, she did it. I'm gonna analyze all my th you know, hundreds of hours of videos in two months. Yeah, right, she did it. Right? Every objective that she set, because of her de determination, she really, she really achieved it all. And uh, it, was, it was really fantastic to be a part of. Right? Alex, I think like many of the grad students here, right, definitely has a big love for the natural world. Frolicking, frolicking around in nature, going to the beach, exploring the ocean, right? So she was well set up, I think, to go down this, this pathway. Right? Her mom told me it was when she did a summer vacation to Monterey when she was young, that be, that's when she decided, I think she went on, she went to the aquarium, went on a boat trip, something like that. She decided she wanted to be a chef and a marine biologist. And I think because she was here mainly during the COVID times, I don't think I got to experience the chef part as much as I would have liked to, seeing some of these culinary skills. <laughs> Uh, but so then I plugged in like to one of those, you know, AI like image generators. What would a chef marine biologist look like? <laughs> and so here, I think this could be <laughs> Alex's future career. The first underwater kelp forest chef. Right, she started her scientific career presenting projects at the LA County Science Fair. So that one on the left there, reaching the boiling point, I think was a prize winner studying, talking about the effects of ocean warming on corals, which is very timely today, we're reading in Florida, the water temperature is at 90 to 100 degrees, all the corals are bleaching, so you are ahead of your time there. <laughs> and then the other one there, all washed up, looking at the effects of water pollution in the water table there. So she's got a good start there with her science communication and presentation. And then she went to USC for her undergraduate degree. There she got a BS in environmental studies and she also got minors in marine biology and political science. And you'll see those themes come up again. She was also in the USC marching band, and I'm sure if Mike Graham was here, he would be singing that Trojan <laughs> fight song right now. Right. Alex got experience in three different laboratories when she was at USC. Uh, she spent a lot of time out at Catalina Island. She learned how to scuba dive, which I think really kind of set her uh, down this path. She worked in labs studying corals, studying eelgrass, studying different species of fish. And so she had a, really a tremendous amount of experience before she came here uh, to Moss Landing. She's also, if you know Alex, she's very passionate about environmental issues and advocacy. That picture on the left, that, the sign, keep the earth clean, it's not Uranus. Perfect. No notes. That, it was amazing. And the, there was even, there was a publication she's been working on from her undergraduate time, which you can see in a, a talk, that she, a seminar she gave there about inclusion and diversity in local environmental organizations, a case study approach. So, so Alex has always been really interested in the policy uh, side as well of, of marine science. Right, so Alex came to Moss Landing Marine Labs at the start of the pandemic, and she was really determined, as I said, right, to get her master's degree, to really crank it out, and to get involved in lots of different things, and she did all of that. Again, she's graduating in three years, which is quite an achievement. Right, she was the Moss Landing student body president for one of those years. 
Uh, she served for probably over a year or more as one of our animal care technicians every day, checking on the health of the fish and water quality and all that stuff. She was also really involved in outreach and leadership. So she was uh, for the Seafood Watch program at the Monterey Bay Aquarium one summer. She was a fisheries and aquaculture outreach intern. She was on the leadership committee for the Society of Women in Marine Science. She volunteered a lot in, in other things like the Sea Lion Bowl. So really got involved. She was also super successful in raising money to support her and her research. So she was awarded over $15,000 to different scholarships and awards. So she got a graduate fellowship from uh, San Jose State, the um, Human Biological Sciences Department. She was a research scholarship and creative activity fellow. So that was a year long program that the two of us participated in. <laughs> uh, she got the Simpkins grant here at Moss Landing. She got a uh, Myers Oce Oceanographic Trust grant, a CSU Coast Graduate Student Award and the WAVE Award three times. So it was, it was like always just getting requests from her for letters of recommendation, which was great because she was really just pushing uh, to get funding. Right, and then as you'll hear for her thesis, right, Alex studied the effects of hypoxia on anti-predator behavior in two species of flatfish. And you know, the different things that she got experiences with, going out on these relaxing cruises, right, <laughs> fun in the sun and on the water, oh, yeah. <laughs> different adventures and animal husbandry, climbing in her tanks and feeding her fish. Yeah, she was kind of a glorified janitor in different <laughs> ways. Right? And then a lot of experience with our temperamental computer-controlled seawater system. As you can see, if you didn't notice it on the first slide, she's giving that, that computer system uh, you know, a piece of her mind. There's that tenacious side. Yeah. And then she left me, but she went back home to, to, to deal with her data and spent many hours watching videos, analyzing her data, writing, editing and cursing me over and over for asking her for more edits and more edits. But she did a really nice job with her thesis, right? And so now after she's done, we'll all give her a big congratulations. It'll be time to dance the night away and hopefully spend some time making some more of these really cool, crazy culinary confections. So good job. And uh, all right, time for Alex. Sure, that it okay, perfect. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming to my thesis. Today I'll be talking about the effects of hypoxia on the anti-predator behavior of English sole and speckled sand dabs. To give you a quick introduction to uh, today's talk, first I'll introduce you to my research topic, then I'll highlight my research objectives, then I'll discuss my methodology for conducting my experiments, we'll go through my significant findings, and we'll discuss my results. And then I'll have a quick acknowledgement section before we have time for questions. My introduction. So as climate change intensifies with rising temperatures and an increase in nutrient pollution, we're seeing an, um, a phenomenon known as eutrophication becoming more and more common. Eutrophication can be defined as an excess of nutrients that stimulate primary production. So this often happens in coastal areas where there's greater stratification, and unfortunately, uh, this depletion of oxygen in the surface layers can result in fish kills and altered food webs throughout uh, coastal waters. If we look at this figure, we can see at the top left-hand corner, um, industries such as farming pollute our coastal waters with runoff and sewage, which lead to these algal blooms. These algal blooms basically are mats on the surface of the water, that start to deplete the oxygen. So as you go further in the water column, there's less oxygen, so fish and animals, uh, other animals that are living on the bottom struggle to survive because there's less oxygen. This phenomenon is called hypoxia and is the focus of my research. Hypoxia can be defined as an insufficient amount of available oxygen, making it difficult for an animal to maintain homeostasis. And as as hypoxia continues to intensify, it can result in a loss of critical habitat, it can lead to a decline in biodiversity, and it can increase the amount of time that a habitat has low oxygen conditions, which ultimately makes it difficult for animals to survive. Unfortunately, this phenomenon is happening right here in the backyard of Moss Landing in the Elkhorn Slough. The Elkhorn Slough is a coastal estuary here in the Monterey Bay. It serves as a biodiversity hotspot and important nursery habitat. 
when we say something's an important nursery habitat, we uh, mean that it provides a lot of services such as food, refuge from predators, or migratory corridors where species can move from one body of water to the next. So overall for the animals that live in the Elkhorn Slough, it, uh, the slough provides favorable growing conditions, optimal prey abundance, and low predation risk. But as I just mentioned, eutrophication is becoming more and more common. As you can see from this figure, this figure was made in 2011, but I can guarantee you today, eutrophication is even more common and more intense here in the Elkhorn Slough. So there's high levels of um, eutrophication. And part of that could be um, due to the nature of the estuary in that there is a mixture of fresh water and salt water that allows for seasonal and spatial variation in temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. But we're especially noticing that in the lower slough, there's an, uh, a mixture of water with fertilizers and sewage from surrounding farms. And this is causing lower salinity and an increase in phosphate, nitrate, and ammonia, which ultimately is reducing the amount of suitable habitat, suitable habitat in the Elkhorn Slough. Uh, a lot of uh, species are struggling to survive with this intense uh, reoccurrence of hypoxia, especially these two species, the English sole and the speckled sand dab. English sole are right-eyed flatfish, and speckled sand dabs are left-eyed flatfish. They both are located in the Pacific Northwest, and they're commonly found um, on the seafloor. They're known as benthic species, um, although the speckled sand dab has a depth limit of about 70 meters. They both prey on benthic invertebrates, while, but the English sole matures at three years old, while the speckled sand dab matures at two years old. And the English sole lifespan is 20 years, and the speckled sand dab is about three to four. Just a little information uh, about those two species. So a previous study, Brown et al., uh, found that estuary habitats make up only 6%, 6% of all available habitat. However, in that same study, they found that about 50% of the adult English sole population in Central California resided in the slough as individuals. So this really proves that the Elkhorn Slough is heavily re relied on by these species as a nursery habitat. They're disproportionately, they, this, the slough is disproportionately contributing to adult populations. A more recent study, Hughes et al. found that English sole will be completely absent from the slough once, it, once the slough reaches hypoxic levels, which is about 4.0 milligrams per liter of O2. Uh, this research study also predicted that about 93% of the population reduction uh, will happen during those hypoxic years. And we'll see these population reductions mainly due to um, a biological limit known as P-crit. P-crit is known as the oxygen concentration in which an organism can no longer maintain a stable rate of oxygen uptake for aerobic performance. So at this level, as you see in the figure, animals need to make the choice to either uh, reduce their daily activities or change and rely on their anaerobic um, activities, which, which is limited by things, by just oxygen. <laughs> so oxygen demand uh, limits the necessary supply for them to meet the metabolic requirements for everyday activities such as growth, reproduction, and, um, and movement. And this is important because for all species, survival is the ultimate goal. However, a combination of stressors will make it difficult to survive. So in the case of my research, I'm looking at two different kinds of stressors. One, chemical stressors, which is that hypoxia, and two, physical stressors, which is predation. So looking at this figure, when, when a fish is met with multiple stressors, it must make the decision to respond in a way that appropriately ensures their survival. And, and so the survival is only guaranteed when that fish makes the right decision. So the, in, a, in a situation when they're limited in oxygen, they must trade off between aerobic capacity, their hypoxic environment, the energy demands of the fish, and the benefit of making those changes. Um, and the, deci the, the decisions they make are critical to their survival as it'll guarantee that the fish will have an opportunity to reproduce. Key to their survival is their use of the sensory system. Fish highly rely on their sensory system um, to detect threats in the water. So again, fish that can obtain the most information 
and then use that information to respond appropriately will be the most likely to survive. So to avoid an evaded predator, they depend on their lateral line to detect motion, and they de depend on their vision to uh, see a threat. They also depend on their olfactory system to detect a chemical threat in the water, and they can often use their hearing in, in their otoliths to detect movement as well. So knowing this, I wanted to understand how the combined stress of predation and hypoxia is going to impact the survival of these juvenile fish. So I set out with a few research objectives. My first objective was to discern how exposure to recurring and intense hypoxia will impact the responsiveness of these flatfish by analyzing their activity levels. Then I wanted to determine if flatfish behavior towards the predators was altered because of exposure to hypoxia. And lastly, I wanted to compare the behavioral responses of English sole and speckled sand dabs to hypoxic stress. In order to um, look into these objectives, I created a few hypotheses. The first being that juvenile fatfish, uh, when under a startle cue, will respond um, with increased response latency, shorter distance traveled, reduced escape velocity, and a decline in activity levels. Under hypoxia, their, their visual and olfactory senses will also be inhibited, resulting in reduced activity levels and a failure to perform defense behaviors. And with increasing hypoxic stress, these flatfish will become vulnerable to predation, and that could be seen through a delayed response to the predator, inhibited defense strategies, or a failure to hide from the predator. And lastly, both species will be limited in their ability to su successfully escape a predator. And I also predict that speckled sand dabs will be more tolerant to hypoxia, um, exhibiting less changes in their behavioral responses. So in order to test these hypotheses, I conducted my three experiments. I used speckled sand dabs and English sole as my prey species and the cabazon as my predator species. To collect the flatfish, I used two methods, the otter trawl, which um, basically you deploy a net into the water and have it towed at, uh, for about 10 minutes, um, hopefully capturing fish on the bottom. And I also used um, seine net fishing, where I deployed a net in the water, hung it vertically, and slowly dragged it to shore, encircling the fish. To collect the predators, I used trap fishing, which um, but you put a trap in the water that contains squid bait for about 30 to 45 minutes. And then we also used hook and line fishing, which was just uh, fishing with a single line rod with squid as bait. In order to understand how exposure to hypoxia alters juvenile flatfish behavior, I put the uh, fish under five different oxygen treatments that range from normoxia to severe hypoxia. So that ranged from 8.0 all the way to 1.0 milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen, or DO. To create these oxygen treatments, as you saw in the picture, I used a Wittrox control system. Um, the system heavily relied on communication between the DAC, the computer, and the Wittrox that you see in this top corner. So using the software, I would set my desired oxygen level, and the computer would communicate to the Wittrox using this um, and, and the Wittrox would use the oxygen probe to measure the oxygen in the water. If the water was not low enough or was off, I would use the nitrogen bubbler to reduce the amount of oxygen in the water. Then once we had the ideal uh, treatment conditions, we then um, had the water flow into the experimental tanks where the flatfish were present. My, for each, for each uh, species and for each treatment group, uh, the experiments were conducted over a seven day period. First, the flatfish underwent a 48 hour DO exposure. After this 48 hours, the startle trials were completed. Then after the startle trials, they were uh, treated for another 36 hours. And then they completed the predator presence trials. And then finally, after 24 hours, they completed the predation trials. And so in summary, I had five DO treatments, two species, uh, 20 fish per DO species, um, so about 100 fish per species for a total of 600 trials. The first experiment I conducted 
was the startle response experiment, experiment. And my hope with this experiment was to simulate an inter interaction between a swift predator and a flatfish. So in order to do this experiment, I first recorded pre-startle activity. Then I released a weight into the water um, that would stimulate a quick acting predator. And then I recorded post-startle behavior. So if we're looking at the figure, the experimental area is this clear plexiglass um, within the larger tank. I use this weight drop system, which is this L-shaped L PVC pipe, which then had a conical weight um, that was so, uh, flown through it and released. And then we used a mirror to capture the fish's movement um, so that we wouldn't interfere with the experiment. To understand how um, hypoxia limits the ability of these flatfish to respond, I measured five different variables, the first being response latency. So how long did it take for the fish to respond to the weight dropping um, before it moved? Then I measured total distance move. So all, for both the pre and post startle, I recorded the, the experiments for two minutes. So within those two minutes, how much did the fish move? Next, their average velocity. So within those two minutes, uh, what was the average velocity? And again, the maximum velocity, what was the fastest they moved within those two minutes? And lastly, the moving duration. So within those two minutes, what percent of time was actually spent moving? So here's an example of what the video may have looked like for pre-startle behavior. And then for post-startle, um, I recommend paying attention to the tip of the PVC pipe where you'll see the weight drop and then the fish moves. So there that weight drops and the fish responds. Next, I completed predator, predator presence trials. For these trials, my hope was to understand how the flatfish um, sensory system is inhibited by hypoxia, especially with their dependency on their senses. I wanted to see if hypoxia inhibits their ability to detect a predator. To, in order to, to test their olfactory and visual senses, I wanted to ensure um, that the cabazon's predator scent was in the water. So I did this a few ways. One, I collected water from the cabazon holding tanks. Then I placed an air pump in the experimental tank to ensure the, the predator scented water was spread throughout the tank. Then I left the predator in the tank for about 30 minutes before the first experiment. And lastly, I ensure there's no fresh salt water flowing into the tank um, throughout any of the experiments. The predator presence trials occurred in two parts, the first being the olfactory trial. So this, is, this is what that experimental setup looked like. Uh, there is a divider between the predator and the prey to eliminate flatfish's ability to detect the predator. So we could see, but not smell. I mean, it could smell, but not see. Sorry about that. Uh, for the visual trial, this is what um, the experimental setup looked like. So the flatfish was free to swim in the presence of the predator. And hopefully you can see there's a barrier in which the cabazon was placed. Um, to prevent them from actually interacting, although the cabazon definitely did try a few times. <laughs> okay, and then in order to measure movement within these trials, I, I used a um, scoring system. Um, so every 15 seconds, the flatfish would receive a score. Uh, the first score, a score of zero, indicated that the fish was flat on the bottom. So that's what this would look like. No movement, just hanging out. A score of one indicated that the fish moved its head or tail but did not swim. So often I was noticing the flatfish would do a head jerk movement and not, not swim entirely, but definitely move their body. So that's what this looks like. Just like a tiny little movement. And then a score of two indicated the fish was swimming on the bottom of the tank. And a score of three indicated that the fish was swimming in the water column. So off the bottom. And then in addition to that, for the visual trials, I also measured fish orientation because I wanted to test whether D 
DO levels affected the position of the flatfish's head relative to the predator. So uh, every 15 seconds, I screenshotted the video and measured the angle of the flatfish. So if they were facing, not facing a predator, it would look like this or a variation of that. And if they were facing a predator, it would look like that. Lastly, I conducted predation trials. So I wanted to understand the combined impacts of hypoxic stress and predation on a flatfish's ability to survive. For this trial, I used one normoxic fish and one hypoxic fish because I wanted to see a direct comparison of how these two, uh, two oxygen conditions impacted their behaviors and their ability to respond. And these experiments were complete once one fish was either eaten or the time limit of 10 minutes was reached. Again, I used that same scoring system that I used for the predator presence trials. And here's a little snippet of a predation trial. So there you go, one was eaten <laughs> and the other one. So at that moment, we would cut the experiment. So in order to test the statistical significance of my research, I used an ANOVA to test the relationship between DO and the calculated change in the startle response variables. I also used it to test the effects of hypoxia on the movement scores in the predator presence olfactory and visual trials and in the predation trials. I used a two-factor MANOVA to evaluate whether DO influenced the orientation of the prey to the predator in the predator presence trials and a chi-square contingency, contingency table to determine if the number of fish consumed was influenced by DO treatment. Alrighty. Moving on to the results. So all of the startle figures are, um, the plotted numbers are the change in, in, the, in the response variables. So what you'll be looking at is post behavior uh, reducted from pre-startle pre behavior. Okay, so looking at total distance moved during the startle response experiments, for English Soul, we see that the normoxic response or the 8.0 response was to increase total distance, um, but there really wasn't a dramatic difference. There definitely is a slight increase, but nothing crazy. And if we look at the lower oxygen treatments, we see a dramatic decline in their total distance moved. Um, so that suggests to me that they are definitely responding differently from the normoxic fish and that the normoxic fish really had minimal changes and actually an increase where the lower decreased dramatically. Looking at the speckled sand dabs, we see that um, the normoxic um, increased their total distance move, but so did the lower oxygen treatments, except, from, except for the 3.0 group. Um, so this suggests to me, for the most part, the lower oxygen were following similar, similar patterns and in their behavior at, in terms of how much distance was moved pre and post startle. Looking at the percent time spent active, for English soul, um, again, the 8.0 groups spent a similar amount of time being active but with a slight decline um, in, in movement. But overall, when you compare that to the low oxygen treatments, the percent of time is definitely noti noticeably lower. Um, so we're seeing a more dramatic change in the response. When you look at the speckled sand dabs, um, all treatment groups did spend less time moving post-startle, and then we see that greatest difference in the frequency of movement in the three and two groups. So again, the normoxic response for the sand dabs was to reduce uh, their percent time active and the other fish did that as well. Looking at mean velocity, for English sole, we see that the 8.0 in the normoxic response is to um, show a slight increase in mean velocity, um, while the low oxygen treatment groups showed a dramatic decline in their mean velocity. So again, rejecting the expected behavior for normoxic conditions and showing an altered response. For the speckled sand dabs, all DO levels um, showed a decline in mean velocity as well. And again, we see a trend with the 3.0 and the 2.0 groups um, declining the most. Looking at maximum velocity for English shoal, in the normoxic group, there's a slight increase in max velocity post-startle. 
Um, and there was an increase in max velocity for the low, but almost no difference for the 3.0 and the 2.0. Um, but again, a large difference for the 1.0. So looking at max velocity, that suggests to me um, for the low oxygen, it really didn't have much effect on two and three, but for one, it was, it, it did change significantly. When we look at the speckled sand dabs, the normoxic group had a large increase in their max velocity post startle. So once that weight dropped, they moved very quickly, um, while the 1.0 had a, a decline in their max velocity, um, as well as the 3.0. So for these two groups, they made the decision to not move as quickly as they did before. For latent to, latency to respond, um, for the English soul, the shortest latency was in those more normoxic groups for 4.0 and 8.0, um, and the longest latency to respond were in the lower oxygen treatment, and the 1.0 group had the longest. So that, that falls in line and agrees with our hypothesis, hypothesis that latency will increase with lower oxygen. Looking at the speckled sand dabs, the higher, highest DO, 8.0, had the shortest latency, so they were the quickest to respond. And 3.0 had the longest latency, but overall the low DO had, had the longest latencies compared to the higher dissolved oxygen treatments. Moving on to predator presence. So these figures are showing uh, a frequency of equal to one, so one being the entire time of the experiment, so what percent of that time was spent using each score. So as you can see in the, the legend, um, those are the movement scores. So for English soul, there's really no significant difference in the frequency of the movement scores. Um, and the low DO followed similar movement patterns when compared to fish in normoxic conditions during the olfactory trial. So when they were just smelling the predator, there really was no major difference in how they behaved. When we're looking at the dabs, again, the difference in their frequency of their movement scores was not significant, um, but as you can see here, the lower dissolved oxygen treatment does spend more time per performing that uh, risky behavior of swimming in the water column. Looking at the visual trials, uh, the English soul, um, again, most of the time was spent not moving. However, we do see that the low oxygen groups do spend more time swimming on the bottom and moving their heads and their tails, especially that 2.0 group. Looking at the sand dabs, um, again, not really much, uh, a lot more time spent not moving, but we do see that the lower DO groups spend more time swimming on the bottom and they have um, a greater rate of that risky behavior of swimming in the water column. When looking at how um, these fish oriented themselves in face of a predator during the visual trials. The English sole um, in the 8.0 group spent more time facing the predator, um, while the, the fish in the lower DO oxygen group spent more time facing um, away from the predator. So uh, I forgot to mention this, but the, the uh, lines in each of these circular graphs indicates the angle of which each flatfish was, um, was uh, during the experiment. So um, in, from degrees zero to 270, that's the facing, and from degrees 270 to 180, that is not facing, as indicated on the first figure. So again, looking at that for speckled sand dabs, um, for the normoxic fish, um, it was, they spent most of their time not facing the predator, while in low, they spent more time facing the predator, except for the 1.0 group, they, um, really spent most time not facing the predator. Um, so again, for these, for these fish, they really had the reverse reaction to the normoxic conditions. Looking at the predation trials, I used a similar method, um, the exact same method actually, to display the movement scores. So for English sole, um, for the normoxic fish, most of their time was spent not moving. Um, over 80% of their time was spent not moving. And then for the lower dissolved oxygen treatment, they spent less time resting and more time swimming on the bottom. Especially if you look at that 2.0 group again, they are swimming the most um, 
which indicates high activity levels. And then for this, the speckled sand dabs, we see that there's really um, mostly similar behavior across all the oxygen treatments, but the 2.0 spend the 2.0 treatment spends the most time performing that risky behavior of swimming in the water column. And lastly, um, flatfish exposed to hypoxia were the most likely to be eaten. Um, looking at these frequency um, figures, we see that for the English sole, the most fish um, eaten were in that 1.0 group. And for the speckled sand dabs, it was um, the 2.0 group. I just want to quickly note that we used a unique set of, of flatfish for the 8.0 group, for the 8.0 fish in these predation trials to ensure that um, these fish weren't getting acclimated to the experiment. So for for the 8.0 group, the sample size was 40 fish, and then for all the rest of the treatments, the sample size was 10 fish. So when you see um, no movement there, it was just a reduced frequency. Moving on to the discussion. So in summary, looking at the startle response, um, these, these tables that I'm about to present compare the response of the flatfish in the low oxygen to um, to the response of those in the normoxic conditions. So if you see um, a change in response, that means compared to the 8.0, the lower did this behavior. So for English sole, compared to the 8.0, um, the lower oxygen English sole reduced their total distance move post startle, while the speckled sand dubs really didn't vary in their response across oxygen treatments. And then when looking at percent of time moving, the English sole decreased their percent of time moving, and the speckled sand dabs really had no difference across oxygen treatments. For mean, velo mean velocity, English sole decreased the mean velocity post startle. The speckled sand dabs really didn't differ that much from normal. And maximum, English sole didn't differ pre and post. And for speckled sand dabs, they increased their velocity and lower oxygen treatments. For latency to respond, both species increase their latency to respond post startle. And here I just want to show a quick video of um, a sand dab recovering from a startle response trial gulping for air. Looking at the effects of low oxygen on the predator presence olfactory trials, we see for the English sole, there really was no difference in the amount of time they spent um, in any of the scores comparing them across oxygen treatments. So um, that indicates to me that either their olfactory systems, or they don't rely on their olfactory systems for predator threat detection, or despite my efforts to ensure that the predator scent was in the water, maybe it wasn't as strong as it needed to be. And again, we see the same trends in the speckled sand dabs. So um, either they just don't rely on their olfactory systems as much as we thought, or um, there are better ways to, to improve the olfactory system, or the olfactory trial. Looking at the visual trials, for scores uh, zero, the English sole didn't really have any difference in the time they spent resting, but they did have an increase in the time they they spent doing head and tail movement. Not really any differences with the time they spent swimming on the bottom or in the water column. But for the speckled sand dabs, no differences in their time spent resting, but an increase in their head and tail movement and their increase um, in the behaviors of swimming on the bottom. But no increase in the behaviors of swimming in the water column. And then for fish orientation, the English sole spent more time facing away, while the speckled sand dab spent more time facing the predator. And there's not really a, a better or right decision because flatfish have a, a almost 360 degree uh, visual perspective. So the choice to face away from the predator may be that the flatfish were looking to escape and find an escape route, or it might be that they were unable to detect a threat, but then facing the predator indicates to me that the sand dabs were able to detect the threat and they were focusing their energy on watching the predator's movement. Looking at those movement scores for the predation trials, 
Um, compared to the normoxic uh, fish, the English shoal in the lower oxygen spent less time resting, less time doing head and tail movements, but more time swimming on the bottom, and not really a difference in how much time they spent in the water column. For speckled sand dab, there is really no difference in the amount of time they spent in each movement score. Here I wanted to show you a flat fat, a flatfish responding to a predator's movement. <laughs> okay. And then looking at the effects of low oxygen on fish's ability to survive a predation attempt. Well, for both English shoal and speckled sand dabs, they unfortunately were not able, they were more likely to be eaten in the lower oxygen treatments. And here is one of those attempts. So in going back to my hypotheses, I just wanted to review whether or not my hypotheses were met um, based on the results of my experiments. So when I first set out to complete these experiments, I predicted that the flatfish would increase the response velocity, they'd have shorter distance traveled, they would reduce their escape velocity, and they'd have a decline in activity levels. Well, I'm gonna say I, that I met it and I also didn't because while both species predict, uh, met the prediction that there would be an increase in response latency and a decrease in mean velocity and percent time moving, the English shoal did have an increase in max velocity post startle, and the sand dabs had an increase in total distance moved post startle. So, kind of yes, kind of no. <laughs> For the second hypothesis of, of whether or not the visual and olfactory senses would be impacted, um, again, yes and no, because there was no observed impact of hypoxia on the olfactory system for both species. Um, and uh, the individuals in both species showed differing responses to normoxia. Um, while they did show differing responses to normoxia in the visual trials, they were um, opposite of what I predicted. So instead of decreasing their movement, the English will increase their head and tail movement and the speckled sand dabs increased both their head and tail movement and swimming on the bottom. So I predicted they would reduce their movement um, and they actually increased a few of their movements <laughs> in response. Looking at the third hypothesis, I predicted that um, they would be vulnerable to a predator in a predation trial which would result in a delayed response, um, inhibited defense strategies or a failure to hide from the predator and we saw those things both, both species performed behaviors that increased detect detectability. English shoal and low oxygen spent more time moving, um, opposed to the normoxic fish that really spent most of their time not moving at all. And then for speckled sand dabs in the low oxygen, they spent most of their time performing risky, risky behavior, either by swimming on the bottom or swimming up in the water column. Looking at the last hypothesis, um, they will be limited in their ability to escape a predator and that speckled sand dabs will be more tolerant. Well, they were limited in their ability to escape a predator because for both species, fish in the low oxygen were eaten most often. And when comparing their behavior to anoxic conditions, the English shoal spent a more dramatic time or dramatic changes in their movement, uh, especially when you look at how they responded to the pre and post startle. We saw way more dramatic differences in their total distance moved and, and those factors. So the main findings of my studies are that both species were negatively impacted by hypoxic stress. Um, based on the findings in this research, I would suggest that English soil exposed to 3.0 milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen or less would be most impacted in their behavior and speckled sand dabs in the 2.0 milligram per liter or less. And this goes, um, this goes against the, the set limit in the Hughes et al. paper of 4.0. So I predict they're actually lower than, than four. 
And then overall, I did see an increased risk of mortality under hypoxic conditions. So my research confirms that there is a direct relationship between the behavioral responses of juvenile flatfish and the level of dissolved oxygen in their environment. So their behavior is changing with lower oxygen. Some of the changes I saw were in their speed of responsiveness, the amount of time they spent moving, their orientation when facing a predator, and their ability to escape a predator. And this research is significant because under intensifying hypoxia, we're going to see more common species migrations and widespread mortalities, which is going to ultimately decline the health of the Elkhorn Slough ecosystem. In addition to that, flatfish play an important role in um, the Elkhorn Slough. They serve as a prey source for leopard sharks and rays. They play a role in breaking down organic matter because they consume plant and animal detritus off the benthos or the bottom of the seafloor. And they're a common menu item in this area, so fishermen rely on flatfish as a source of income. And lastly, they're an indicator species within the Elkhorn Slough. Um, as I stated before, they are a benthic species, so they're already used to some um, exposure to low oxygen. So if an organism that is adapted to withstanding short-term hypoxia is unable to endure increased long-term hypoxia, it will be difficult for other species to deal with these same pressures, and ultimately, they will struggle to survive. So the hope of this research is to make some predictions about how other um, organisms within the environment are going to respond to hypoxia and in hopes to create science-based management and policy to protect this ecosystem and the species that live in it. Lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge a few people who helped me along the way. First, to my superhero committee <laughs> that made it all possible. Dr. Scott Hamilton, my advisor, and my committee members, Dr. Amanda Kahn and Cheryl Logan. Um, all three of them were necessary and needed members of me reaching this milestone. Um, Scott was always willing to help me in so many ways, whether that be uh, writing me every recommendation I could send him for opportunities or scholarships, or driving hours to San Jose just so I can receive one of the scholarships, or um, you know, hopping on a last minute boat ride so that I could collect fish. Um, Amanda really helped me and guided me with my writing and helped me to be a more concise science, scientific writer. And, and Cheryl was so thorough in her edits and her attention to detail when helping me to, to produce the best thesis possible. So I just want to say thank you to all three of you for all your efforts to help me graduate. <laughs> and last, uh, not lastly, sorry, to all the people within the Moss Landing community that helped me along the way. It really did take a village. Um, Grace, Laura, Noah, Jack, Juliana, Matt, Luke, and Taylor, all of you helped me in so many different ways, often dropping what you were doing to, to help me figure out a problem or a solution. Um, and so I'm so grateful for the time you offered me. And to the Moss Landing staff, Tara, JD, James, Kevin, Jane, and Theo, all of you were essential to um, helping me get my research off the ground, collecting fish, getting um, the financial support and, and the support in the lab. And to Mike for helping me with IT today during my thesis defense. And lastly, to some uh, Cal State Monterey Bay students, Avery, special, especially. Um, Avery was my undergraduate research assistant, and I definitely wouldn't have survived last summer without her and her ability to calm me down in stressful situations. <laughs> and to Nick and Deo and Connor and Samarth, who helped me with fat, flatfish collections and just fish maintenance overall. And uh, another thank you to the organizations that supported my research and me as a student. Um, without these, um, without these funding support, which, without this funding support, I wouldn't have been able to finish my research. So, to the San Jose um, Research and Innovation Committee for the fellowship, for CSU Coast for the research award, the Myers Trust and Moss Landing for various awards, and to the. Uh, Department of Biology at San Jose for the Pisano Scholarship. And lastly, but not least, thank you to my mom. <laughs> uh, 
Um, she always believed in me and let me explore the oceans near and far, whether that be um, 30 minutes away in Malibu or all the way in Australia. She really helped me chase my dream. Um, when I was in high school, my mom would drive me 60 miles one way to the Aquarium of the Pacific so that I can volunteer. Um, so I'm just so grateful for all the efforts. And I think it's pretty serendipitous that 10 years before um, my first day of school, I was uh, on a research trip with my mom <laughs> in the Monterey Bay. And then 10 years later, I was at Moss Landing starting my graduate degree. So big thank you to my mama. <laughs> right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Any questions? How the anti-predator response in the tank compares to that in the wild? Like, are they burying themselves in the wild? Um, yeah. Okay. So, was there like, a, like, how how did you decide not to add any substrate to the yeah, tank? Yeah. Uh, when I was doing my trial experiment, so a normal flatfish behavior would be to bury themselves in the sediment, especially living on the bottom. Um, that would be the best way to hide. And especially their coloring, um, it looks like the sediment. Um, so. Unfortunately, when I was doing the trial runs for these experiments, I just, um, I noticed, especially in the predation trials, the, flat, the Amazon just weren't able to detect the fish. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> so I had to remove um, the sediment because um, it's just so dark. And because I had um, I had a tarp around the, the experimental tank, it was already dark enough. And um, it was just really hard for the Amazon to detect. And, it was already difficult enough to get these fish to eat, um, <laughs> so I, I just wanted to ensure that a predation attempt would happen. But that is a good point. In the wild, they do have that defense mechanism and might increase their ability to survive, especially because they're able to, to hide. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I was interested if there was any like life history traits or differences between the two species that would lead to all of their sort of different like reactions to your response variables. Yeah, I, I predict that it's their, their size. I didn't include this in my presentation today, but in my thesis, um, you're able to see, I, I measured the weight of all the fish and comparing the English holm speckled sand dabs, the sand dabs are actually two times as big as all of the English holm that I used in my trial. Um, within all of the treatments. So they're always about twice the size of the fish, so I'm predicting that that made them, especially when we look at the predation uh, results, it looks like 
to say it has to get eaten more often, but actually I don't think that's I don't think that would be the case in the wild. It's just because they are bigger in size, twice the size, and also um, uh, they they perform. I mean, they did perform more risky behavior, especially in the 2.0 group. They were swimming at the top of the water column, so things like that really make um, a fish obvious because they're flapping and splashing at the top of the of the water column. But yeah, I I definitely attribute it to their size. Okay. Thank you. For the, uh, the mortality data, um, it would have been really hard to standardize for this, but did you notice any differences with the oxygen concentration on the Cabazon? Like, were they less or more? I didn't, uh, I didn't place the Cabazon in uh, lower oxygen. I just uh, used an aromatic fish. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. not as bad as it was in the wild. Like, the So uh, these, so for these results, mm -hmm. these fish getting eaten at one milligram per liter of oxygen. Yes. Did you take them and put them in normoxic water with the, with the cabazon? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's also uh, part of the reason why um, I limited the experiment because um, at this current moment in time, we don't know how long hypoxia impacts a flatfish and, and, and is within their system. So. I was worried if I continue this for 30 minutes, they might recover, and that would be pointless to my experiment. <laughs> gotcha. So yeah, good question. They have the possible effects. They all they all go into high oxygen treatments. Mm -hmm. They have been you know, for a couple days in low oxygen, so they're still the rates a little slow. I guess. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. So I think following what you did. Yeah. You did the like startle response first, and then you took those fish and did the, the predator response, yeah. right? Do you do you know? Was there any like relationship between the fish that like responded the way you might think in that startle response to like getting eaten more quickly or less quickly yeah. than the others? Was it like a because yeah. it seemed like that your like some of your other metrics were a bit mixed in result, but when it came to the predator, it was pretty clear they just got eaten. Yeah, unfortunately, that was a thought I had after. That's something I would definitely do differently is individually tag the fish instead I tag them by treatment um, so that I could tell that. Um, but I was I didn't individually tag them, which would have been really helpful to compare, oh, are the fish that are taking the longest to respond to startle, are they the ones getting eaten? So that's definitely something I would redo. A question in the chat oh. from Emily. Great job, Alex. Given that the soul has a four times longer lifespan compared to the do you think age should have been a one factor in the results of the human responses? We, we, and we, by the way, um, we took the flatfish um, from the slough at the same time, so, so in different time increments, we were, so I, I wouldn't factor age because most of our collections were within a month. So, I guess the follow up post was the, were the fish the same, despite being different sizes and having different lifespans, were they the same age when you kind of collected them from the environment? Uh, we believe so. I obviously didn't look at their otoliths and, and, and count their, their rings on the otoliths, but uh, we did collect them during the juvenile recruitment period uh, for both of these species. Um, and uh, Again, they're recruited and taken from the slough at the same time, so I'm assuming they're relatively the same age. 
um, they def you can definitely tell the difference in a juvenile without pushing an adult, and I would not have taken uh, an adult back to the lab. So I, I really don't think their age is too different. Um, so, I'm assuming that there are a bunch of different predators on these fish. How did you choose Cabazon? Uh, in my, in my, um, in running my trial experiments, I actually tested, I think, seven different species of piscivorous fish or fish that eat other fish. Uh, and the Cabazon, in the previous summer, was the only fish to consistently and actively eat the flatfish. So I said, why not save me the time and just focus on collecting caps on? Um, so that's why I think my better issues. <laughs> yes. Based on all the different uh, behavioral responses that you measured, can you pinpoint which one or which ones you think maybe led to the higher proportion of the sand dogs getting eaten at the higher geo levels? Yeah, I would say looking at the predation trials. Uh, again, swimming in the water column, I think would be one of the key behaviors that would lead to a, a flatfish getting detected because uh, if you can see, and I think the first video I showed of swimming in the water column, they're splashing, they're making, you can you can tell something's moving up there. So especially for a cabazon that's already uh, looking up and their eyes are fit oriented up, that, that would be um, the easiest to detect. Uh, Definitely just any movement in general, because something still is, is, is not going to be as attractive as something moving, trying to escape. Um, it's also probably an easier kill because they're already moving and you can catch them swimming. So it seems like then, if even if you did have substrate, you would probably still see that effect oh, right in the true. Traps because they were, they were moving. moving. Yeah, so. they were up in the water. Pump. That's true. But I'm not going to start with you, so you those. Which of those do you think most contributed to them being eaten? Probably latency to respond, because um, as I stated in my introduction, the fish that are able to most quickly um, collect those cues of, of when there's a threat in the water are the most likely to survive. So if you're taking longer to even recognize that there's a threat in the water, um, it's more likely that that threat is going to catch you. <laughs> so the dumb ones got eaten. Any other questions? All right, let's hear the Alex. And <laughs>